Hi everybody, um, I hope you can understand as I speak. My name is Peter Milne and you can tell by the colour of my hair that I've been around for a while. So I've done a lot of things. Today I'm a technology architect, I work for Adform, but I've worked in lots of places, lots of countries in the world, lots of projects around the world. I've been a hardware engineer, a junior developer, uh, a project manager, by the way I hated being a project manager. Um, I've done uh, large pro software engineering projects, run my own business, worked in 38 countries, and here I'm finishing my career working for an ad tech company that has a large office in Lithuania. So I'm here by choice. I moved from the United States to uh, uh, Copenhagen, in fact, to join Adform. You can find me on Twitter and at GitHub. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my wisdom and knowledge. We're going to have a little bit of fun and then I'll give you a little bit of advice. So this is the history of computing according to me. We started out with batch processing. You'll notice the 80 column card up there. In 1980 I worked on a deck 10. I programmed by punching 80 column cards. I put the source code in on the cards and the data was on the cards. That was at university, it was a lot of fun. We went from batch and then we went to interactive processing as it was called in those days and everybody said interactive processing would replace batch. But it didn't, it just added to it. Then in the 80s we got SQL which became the most religious, righteous way to store data. Uh, we had graphic user interfaces, this is Windows 3.0. Uh, once again, there was the religious argument whether a Mac was better than Windows. Then we got client-server, which we call distributed computing today. All of these things were, bo were going to be revolutionary, were going to be a change. They added to it. In the early 90s, we got object orientation. And my gosh, was that a war. The things that happened in there. Then we got the web was invented. So I did my master's degree in the early 90s and I did my research partly in the university library which had no books in it and um, partly through browsing the web. Then we got mobile. Mobile's an interesting concept. I'm not talking about just talking on the phone. I'm talking about the distributed computing in the mobile. And now we're in the second generation of the 21st century, where we're supposed to have flying cars, by the way. Um, and we have things like big data. And we have things like uh, deep learning, complex things, hard things. In the old days, projects were simple. They were a well-known algorithm that you were trying to solve. You can see the towers of Hanoi over there. It was probably one programming language, probably COBOL or Fortran. It was done on a single machine. The machine was really big. In fact, it was the biggest cost of the project. The hardware you ran on cost more than the software development. The, there was only a few programmers that worked on it. There would be a handful. There'd be one or two analysts. One programming language, a few analysts, a few programmers, well, done, well understood product domain, single machine, single data saw, single schema. That's where Waterfall came from. Today, we don't have the same problem. We have huge scales. There will be several programming languages in the solution you deliver, even if one of them is, is a bash script. Thousands of developers, hundreds of people analysing it, lots and lots of features. Literally thousands of machines. And we'll be doing stuff that nobody knows how to do. So it's hard. We could never build a traditional waterfall program or process or, or um, project. There are three different components that all start with P using and build a solution like this. So we need a technique that is scalable and flexible. And parallelism is a way to scale things. So we have complexity in what we do. We're actually trying to divine signal from noise. 
There's a lot of noise going on. We're trying to find the signal in it. How complex is it? Can you explain it to your mother? If you can't, it's complex. That's not saying your mother's stupid. It's just a generational thing. Um, so I have a rhetorical question here. How does complexity affect the project? Okay, hardware progress. This was the first computer I programmed on, the DEC-10. Wonderful. When I was a, a young lad in the 70s, I was a teenager, my father taught me how to build digital electronic circuits with discrete components, no ICs. I, I built a digital clock and I started from that point and that's where I came from. The first microprocessor I used was an Intel 8085. It had six and a half thousand transistors on it. Today, the, uh, the, the Broadwell chips in Intel have got seven billion transistors in them. Every two years, the number of transistors in a certain physical size in a chip doubles, according to Moore's law. How will that affect your project? How will that affect the complexity of your project? Oh, nice. We'll just go back a few steps here. All right. When we have a distributed system, who works on a monolithic system today that doesn't use more than one computer? Okay, so we're all in this boat together. The CAP theorem talks about uh, distributed computing, consistency, availability, and partitioning, and the theorem says that you can only have at most two of these things. So if you want completely a consistent system that's not distributed, that's at the top. A CP system is where you have uh, consistency and data partitioning, so it's available on multiple machines, but if one of them goes down, some of the data is not available. An AP system is where you're going to have all of the data available, but you might have inconsistent data between replica copies of something. So how does this affect your project? How does that affect the way you do agile work? All right. Let's talk about the adoption of Agile. Agile is now a formal way of doing things. I can recall doing Agile things in the late 80s and certainly through the 90s. It used to be called something like an iterative process. In fact, my company's name was Iterative Consulting because we wanted to make money because people thought it was cool. But let's look at the graph. You've got a bunch of people who are leaning towards Agile. So they've adopted some of the concepts You've got a bunch of people who are purists, you know, who love Agile and they go home, they wake up every morning and they have a stand up with their family. <laughs> Lots of people have hybrid components. Uh, when you have legacy systems, you may have to have a hybrid mechanism. And then there's a few of these, uh, I don't know, heretics that still want to live in the old days. They're the Luddites of the world, they don't want to modernize. So Agile is becoming common. Take a look at the cartoon. Um, I've worked for two companies who've behaved that way. Oh, we're not gonna do anything new, we're just gonna slide into obsolescence. So I'm gonna have a bit of fun now with you, a day in the life of Agile, and then I'll give you some advice. Okay, perspectives. This is what I think I do. This is what my mother thinks I do. This is what the finance department thinks I do. This is what the business thinks I do all day. I might do a little bit of that, but don't tell them. This is what they want me to do. And probably this is what I actually do. Now, in Australia, I'll be crude for just a moment. In Australia, we have a term called pushing shit uphill. Okay. All right, so management by miracle. Just because you've got a process and a technique, you're not gonna be able to deliver software if the plan's unrealistic. Nine women can't have a baby in a month, okay? The stakeholder, the stakeholder, the business uh, owner, the business sponsor, the, it's the person with the money. If you're in the private sector, you're being paid to deliver a product that's going to make the company profitable. 
If you're in the public sector, sector, you're being paid by the government to improve the community. So it's the person with the money. You, uh, if you're in the public sector, it's taxation dollars that are going to be spent and you have an obligation to spend them correctly. If you're in the private sector, it's uh, shareholders' money, something like that, designed to make a profit. So you have a responsibility. I know we're software developers, but we do have to think about money. Okay, requirements. Requirements will always be incorrect. Agile gives us a way to mitigate the risk of building the wrong thing, running down and doing something for nine months and going, oh, well, you know, that airplane needs two wings instead of one. So it's impossible to get them all right at the beginning. They will change during the process and there will be more requirements than time and money can deliver. Uh, you get the business to choose how they want to spend their money. Okay, user stories. These things used to be called use cases. Use case, the word use case got hijacked into something else. But a use case was something that the user wanted or some way, how somebody used the system. They're supposed to become a part of a feature, a feature or several features. They're supposed to be something that could be put into production. Whether they are or not, it's a different, it's a project issue. But it's what the user wants or needs. Okay. Um, they're absolutely going to change over time. And they're absolutely going to be, um, you, you absolutely won't have enough time to do everything. What are we doing here? I'm going the wrong way. Estimates. Okay. Estimates are a guess. They are your best guess because you have some experience. The English term is a gut feel. You don't know why it's going to take five days to do that job. You think it will. You will be wrong, but it doesn't matter. Your guess is better than zero or better than infinity. Okay? So don't be worry about it. But they're not freaking deadlines, okay? Sorry, did I say freaking? I nearly said fuck, but I didn't want you to think I was going to be crude. Okay, planning. It's what we have to do and when we have to do it. It's as simple as that. All of the techniques, all of the ways of doing it, all boil down to it's what we've got to do and when we've got to get it done by. And when we've got to get it done by is, is a business decision. We have to have this before Christmas because of a business reason. We have to have this uh, implemented because in Parliament it was decided by our government that we were going to have this system in by a certain time, according to a law. Okay, iterations. What are they? Iterations was what they used to be called sprints, or what they're called now. It's the fashionable name. They're chunks of manageable work that we can deliver, that we can give out or possibly run. Okay? They're not pieces that you're not going to build half a wheel you're going to build a whole wheel in that time you're not building the car in a sprint but you're building part of it okay the scrum master the scrum master is your friend is your buddy they go to those absolutely terrible meetings so you don't have to okay the warden of the scrum and the protector of the team Conversely, that's what you see them as, right? This is what they do, you know, become a scrum master, they said. It will be easy and rewarding, they said. If you're not quite sure what this guy is doing, he's up to his waist in sewerage. That's what a scrum master does. Stand-ups. Stand-ups are interesting. Um, why do we stand up in a stand-up meeting? It's to keep it short particularly in America. Okay, if you've not been to America, you'll find that the average size of an American's ass is about 150% of yours. So they're gravitically challenged. They're challenged by gravity that causes them to bend and get back down again. Stand-up meetings. I'm glad that the gentleman from the law firm is here. He asked a lawyer question before. Did you notice? Um, 
my wife, who currently lives in the US, works for a law firm, and she was having trouble managing her team, finding out what they were doing. And I said, in every morning for five minutes, have a meeting in the corridor where everybody stands up and they all talk about what they're doing and you give them some leadership for the day. She says, don't I need a conference room? And I went, no, have them stand up. If you have a conference room meeting, it'll take 35 minutes. If you have them stand up and everybody's got a cup of coffee in their hand and perhaps they need to go to the bathroom or something, they'll get through their stuff quickly and you'll know what's going on. The idea is everybody needs to know what's going on. The scrum master in their head knows what's happening right now. Okay, burn down lists. It's essentially what you have left to do or what's been done. Okay? It's designed so that there's some progress so the boss knows. Remember, someone's paying you. They want to have a feeling about where it's going. Always when you build a software development project, you've got money from somewhere to do it and you have, somebody has to account for that money. Okay? Please don't use this technique for improving your burn down. Okay, refactoring. Refactoring is writing code the way it should have been done in the first place. It's a relative statement. So um, I'm nearly 60 years old and I first started writing code when I was 20. If I looked at the code I wrote last year, I'd be embarrassed. If I looked at the code I wrote when I was 20, I'd want to, you know, quit the uh, IT industry and become an Uber driver. Uh, so it's a relative statement. The way it should have been written in the first place. When you wrote it two years ago, it was the best you could do. Just because you're refactoring it doesn't mean you're an idiot. It just means that you've learned something and have improved. Just as Ben said, continuous improvement. All right. Avoid having a superhero in the company or in your project. You know who the superhero is? It's the person who is very good at just about everything. Oftentimes, they're called an architect or a team lead. If you have the superhero, they're going to go on vacation or they're going to have a baby or they're going to leave the company because somebody offers them more money or they're going to get hit by a bus. And so... To describe this as another situation from the Australian lingo, you will be up shit creek without a paddle. So avoid having a superhero. If there's somebody who is the legend in your team, learn why they're the legend and become their protege. Okay. All right, I like Game of Thrones, can you tell? Test-driven. Why do we write tests up front? In a project that I managed, we would write the requirement specifications and I would have the testers at that point write their test plan based on the requirements while my developers were, were writing the code. Deliberately so that they interpreted the same documentation, the same specification to get the right results. So we knew when we were going to be successful or whether we were failing. Having a test-driven development allows you to lower your costs because you catch bugs early. You catch the stupid bugs that you don't think you'll ever see. And it combats entropy. Entropy is when you, if you don't test something and you leave some code alone for two years, it will break all by itself. It's like having a, a teenage boy in your home. You know, you tidy up their room, you make the bed and you fold their clothes and you let the teenage boy into the room for a week, and after a week it will be a mess. Not because he's a bad boy, just because that's entropy. Okay. Um, adding people to a late running project will make it run later. Okay, if you're getting short of time, you're going, oh dear me, I was going to say oh shit, but I didn't want you to think I was crude. Um, you know, I'll say, oh dear me, we're running out, our deadline is two days, let's get some help. What will happen, it will be longer than that, because you have to teach them what to do, how to behave in the project process, and perhaps in the code that you're working on. Okay, continuous integration. 
In fact, I can remember doing continuous integration in the 1980s. We wrote our own code to do this because there wasn't any, any tools, but it was the process. Automated builds, absolutely essential. If your build is a multi-part process with 85 steps and it involves uh, several different people, you're doing it wrong. There's got to be a way to automate it. This is the second decade of the 21st century, when we should have had flying cars, by the way. Um, it allows you to discover problems early. On a project that I ran, uh, I gave the person who broke the build the silly hat, and they had to wear the silly hat the whole day. It was okay to break the build. If you did it a lot, we had a, had a long conversation about your future, but, but it also avoids risky behaviour, okay? Now, if you had a, a wood chipper and you had a shovel with a handle in your hand and it was jammed, what would you put into the wood chipper? Your leg or the handle of the shovel? Okay, I want to talk about pair programming just once. <laughs> in the um, early 2000s, pair programming was going to be the panacea that was going to be the cure for um, every, every, it was going to cure cancer, it was going to prevent global, global warming, it was going to produce Middle East peace. Um, sometimes it doesn't work. And when I say sometimes, I go, most of the time it doesn't work. There's the special case where you are stuck on a problem. You get two people who are equally skilled or three people with equally skilled and you all look at the problem together. And you might pair program for that. But if you have a legend and you have a junior guy or girl and you try to put them together as a pair, it won't be productive. And I'll tell you after why it won't be productive. Okay, retrospectives. This is where you work out what went wrong. You go through the process and you decide, oh, that was a mistake. Okay? They're very good. You should schedule time as part of the sprint to do a review. It costs a little bit of time to make sure that you're not continuing to be silly. All right, so we've had some fun. I've given you some history, now we'll do Uncle Pete's advice. The first piece of advice is that we're all a little bit stupid, okay? In fact, my term is that we're all idiots, we're just a little bit less of an idiot in certain areas. But it's not a competition. You don't have to be the dumbest guy or girl in the team. All right? So talk to your colleagues about things. If you've got this brilliant idea, don't sit up all night coding it. Talk to someone, say, I've had this idea, what do you think? And they'll either be impressed and uh, you can proceed with it. They'll be either pissed off because it's a great idea and they didn't have it, then you still proceed with it. Or you'll both come to the conclusion that it wasn't a great idea. Please don't code it and hope for the best. Just slide it into the, to the main branch at some point. Okay. Whenever we don't know what we're doing, we start with a hypothesis. It's kind of a dream. We don't know whether it's true, but we assume that it is until we prove that it's not. So building software, we start with a hypothesis that we want to build an anti-gravity machine. We assume that we can, then we're going to try it. But the value or the parameters or the size and shape of the um, anti-gravity machine should be well understood by everybody in the process. All right. Now I'm going to offend everybody in the room. Project management is an essential technique to get from what the customer explained they wanted to what they actually needed. You'll notice that they could be a little inaccurate in their explanation. They'll assume that you know something. I worked on a project for a large major bank and they all assumed that we knew what bank lending was all about and they would forget to tell us things. We used to have to tie them down and put them on the rack to get the information out of it. So it's a technique to get from the dream to reality. It's not an industry. We do have project managers and project management techniques. So is anybody here from Accenture? 
Okay, talk to me after about Accenture and Deloitte and PricewaterhouseCoopers and stuff like that. They are an industry. So all this other stuff in the middle is part of project management. We get it wrong, but that's why we have project managers. All right, agile is a frame of mind. It's a flexible technique to manage a project. It allows new info to alter the outcome of the project. We use it because the problems we're solving today aren't the same as the primitive accounting systems that we solved in the 1970s and 80s. They're complex, they're hard, and we don't have a well-defined principle on it. Okay, so that's what Agile is. This is what Agile is not. It's not an excuse for being disorganized or having a short attention span. It's not an excuse for going, oh, I've just read about this cool new technology. <gasps> Why don't we use that? It's not an excuse for being the CTO of a company. And when anybody comes up with an idea, you've got to put your finger in the pie all the way up to your elbow. It's also not a club, a social group, or a cult. Today, you will hear practical information from people about how to use Agile to manage projects. You can use all or part of what they teach you today. It's valuable. But if you fail to do some portion of it, like you fail to have your, um, I don't know, your sprints well-defined or your tasks put in the right place, it's not the end of the world. Okay? It's not a cult. It's not a religion. We're not all going to go to heaven and have 72 virgins at the end of it. Okay? And finally, Uncle Pete's final words for you is that a well-designed application should deliver the right result. One and one should equal two all of the time. It shouldn't equal 1.9 some of the times and 2.1 some of the times. It should perform adequately. And in that adequate time, it should give you the result that's acceptable to you. I work for an ad tech company, so um, 50 milliseconds is how fast things have to perform. In an accounting system, maybe two seconds is good enough. This is the kind of thing. It should perform adequately. It should be maintainable by the average guy or girl. That means he or she should be able to look at your code and go, yeah, I understand. There's enough white space around it. There are sufficient comments. And you haven't used the most obfuscated piece of code because you're clever. If you write a cool piece of code like that, it's called technical masturbation, okay? You do it in the privacy of your own mind. At the end of it, you feel really good, but nobody else has benefited from it, okay? And somebody else in the future will have to clean up the mess. I don't know why you're laughing. The other thing is your project should be on time and on budget. Um, the worst ones are where projects run over by two years and they run out of money and things like that. Nothing is more valuable, nothing signifies the success of the project than code running in production. You can have the most perfect, dogmatically correct <laughs> project where everything's beautiful and people have got wonderful burn down lists and Gantt charts and all of those kind of wonderful things. But if you don't produce something that works, it's no value. So if this is your goal, and these are principles in the goal, then apply agile techniques to get you there. All right. Anybody got any questions for me? We have a gentleman just there in the beautiful orange shirt. Uh, first question is about this pie chart at the beginning of your presentation. You're going to ask me where I got the numbers? Yes. Okay, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> because I may or may not have acquired those numbers and have published them 
possibly, because the lawyer's over there, possibly, perhaps, without the permission of the people I got those numbers from. <laughs> Just possibly. Um, what I wanted to do with that pie chart was why I didn't put real numbers on them, was because it shows you that everybody's thinking in this direction. I can't imagine a future in computing where Agile is not the fundamental tenant of the way we go and we build software. In fact, it ha has been said many times that Agile is the way good developers have done it forever, and the answer is true. Any other questions? There's one right down the back there. Test. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that you worked on big scale projects. Uh, did you use Agile on those? And okay. if you did, uh, did you, how that went? Okay, so let me tell you a little anecdote here. I've only got about five minutes. I uh, was called into a project in 2001. It was a large bank in Australia, so maybe the third largest bank. They had spent $20 million and two years, and nothing was passing acceptance testing. Nothing. $20 million. So if I had one-tenth of that, I could probably live for the rest of my life like a king. So I came into this project, and everything they were doing wrong. The uh, requirements gathering was incorrect. The software engineering process was incorrect. The software architecture was wrong. The uh, project management techniques were wrong. Everything was wrong. So I got called into that, and they said, here, fix it. And I went, oh, shit. So for about six weeks, I didn't sleep at night. But the first thing we did was we, we introduced principles of Agile. So in those days, there wasn't Scrum, there wasn't extreme project programming, but Agile or iterative processes were available. So we had what we called iterations. They were exactly two months in length, so that's a long time for Sprint. But what we did was we got the, the um, business analysts to write stories, we called them use cases, we costed the use case and said it's going to take this long and this wide and it's this tall and this fat and this ugly and this beautiful. And we said to the business, you choose. What do you want us to do in the next, before the next release? And then the business would choose. So instead of just our necks being on the chopping block, so was the business's necks on the chopping block. So I had, um, I had 57 developers in that team uh, I had uh, 30 testers, and that was my side of the, the house. Um, I actually cut down the developers from 57 to under 30, and we had a productivity increase. Uh, that's a, a separate discussion. But the principles we applied there were sound, fundamental, ordinary software engineering stuff like build and test every day. No, we can't build. We have to build every two weeks. And I said, all right, we'll build every two weeks. After first two weeks, we were building and testing every day. Um, so we, we mentioned before that it's a people thing. People think they can't, but people are spectacular. I've moved from sunny Australia to freaking cold Europe to work with some spectacular people. I particularly like this part of the world. Last year, I taught a, a course in Vilnius, and I had... 20 people from Adform and 10 students from Vilnius University and a couple of professors. The course usually takes nine and a half hours to run. These wonderful, talented, attentive people did it in about eight hours. They weren't cheating, their code was right, the questions were correct. So there's something special about Lithuania. I suspect that it comes through the heritage of your history. I think you've been kicked around by just about everybody in the world, and yet you've survived and become vibrant, talented, intelligent people. So there's something special about this region. People are everything. Tools and techniques are fun, but people are everything. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Okay, Peter, I want to say big thanks to you and give a small present from our organization, Agile Lithuania, that you will remember us in Australia. <laughs> okay.
Once again, big applause to Peter.